All right, good morning. This is going to be Acts chapter number 9, part 2. Acts chapter 9, part 2. So if you have your Bibles, please turn to Acts chapter number 9. We spent uh, last week kind of giving you guys an overview of the chapter, and the chapter of Acts uh, chapter 9 it is a very important chapter. It's a, it's a chapter in which uh, we start to uh, encounter some things in relation to uh, God's program that has been hid, and as a result, we, we come to some questions as we read through Acts and go, well, hold on, this is kind of a little bit different than what Peter's been saying. This is a little bit different than I, I, I kind of remember Jesus Christ talking about how, how are we going to reconcile these issues. So uh, I also want to just briefly mention thanks to those who listen on YouTube. We have a lot of YouTube listeners. We've been having more and more. I'm getting subscribers like every week, every day. We're having, you know, I think this, this, this next month, uh, last, the last 30 days, we had something like 1,200 video views. So that's a lot. And I really appreciate those people listening. 1,200 is, that's a, lot of, that's a lot of views. And that's growing like crazy. And we're getting a lot of people listening. We're getting a lot of dialogue. Uh, I had some dialogue with some of my friends who I posted. We have a Facebook group that I invite people to. They're listening to it. We're going back and forth on some issues, breaking things down, and that's really great. So I, I, uh, I greatly appreciate you guys listening, and I hope to maybe one day see you guys in the service. I know a lot of guys are in, in other states. We have people in other countries listening. Uh, that's great. I'm glad we can administer that way. So we provided a brief overview of the, of the conversion of the Apostle Paul. So obviously this takes place in Acts chapter number 9. His name was Saul of Tarsus. He was a leader in the Jews' religion. He was one who was very devout, and we looked at his, uh, his, his, his wrath that was being uh, outpoured toward those disciples of Jesus Christ. So he hated those disciples. He thought, as we showed last week, that he was doing God service, that he was, he was on God's side in his killing and in his threatening and in his punishment of the disciples of Jesus Christ. And lastly, we kind of showed the beginning of this appearance of Jesus Christ to Saul on the road to Damascus. We knew why he was going to Damascus. He was going there because he wanted to be even more zealous. He really wanted to prevent the, the name of Jesus Christ from being preached in any synagogue. He didn't care where those synagogues were, but he wanted to make it very clear that from Jerusalem it was outlawed, it was banned, and that if you preach in that name, we were going to bring you bound to Jerusalem and we were going to punish you and we would take it in so much as, you know, stoning if it had to go that way. We would, we would kill you like we killed Stephen. We're not, a, we're not afraid to do it. If you're not going to stop it, we're going to make it happen. So it's very clear that Paul was a, was a man who, who, who greatly had devotion toward God, right? If you don't know that passage in Romans 10, it's one of those great passages. It's just one of those ones that, that helps out so much where, where Paul says, you know, for I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. And that's kind of what Saul of Tarsus was doing. He definitely had a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. He didn't understand. That's why he says, I did it ignorantly. I did it in unbelief. And we're going to see that his zeal of God turned into a real zeal of God when met with the truth. So we started to unravel the dispensational importance of Jesus Christ's visitation and his appearance and how this really differs from the prophetic program. In the prophetic program, there is a visitation of Jesus Christ and it's called the second advent or the second coming. It's not just a coming, it's a point in time in which God the Father sends back Jesus Christ to earth. And it takes place at a very specific time in which all the prophetic elements are fulfilled. Peter talks about that in Acts chapter 2 and in Acts chapter number 3 when he says that God will send back Jesus Christ, whom before was preached unto you, when at the times of restitution of all things, which are spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. So very clear, the, the mouth of the holy prophets, what did they do? They spoke a lot. There's a lot of prophets in the the word of God. So those prophets, when they spoke, they also spoke concerning the last days. You read what Peter says. He says, as many as have spoken have likewise foretold of these days, meaning the days that they're in right here at this, at this end of uh, uh, this, this issue with Stephen, the, the perceived end of the world, they're in these last days. And what we're going to see is, is 
are, are we still in the last days? I mean, think about what's happened here. They were, they were really, uh, I think that their perception was, you know, Peter and the rest, they, they really had had an understanding that, that it was going to take place very quickly. It wasn't something that was going to take a long time. And they knew what was going to comp- come upon those who would not believe, and those who did not believe was utter destruction. It was the wrath of God. We're going to break this down because I want to show you today how, how it's so important for you to see what the prophetic program tells you is going to happen in relation to what happens here. Because if you've been reading and studying with us through the book of Acts, you're going to get to Acts chapter number 9, and you're kind of like, all right, Jesus Christ, get ready to slay some people. Get rid of this Saul of Tarsus guy. Let's, let's kill him. Because he's definitely ready to be killed. I mean, we need, we need, we need some vengeance poured out here. He's already killed others. He's going he's gonna to keep going. So as I said last week, Saul, is he a very devout man? Of course he is. But like that Romans 10, he's, he doesn't have the knowledge. He thinks he does, but he really doesn't. So let's pick up in Romans 9. We'll read just a, probably the first 16 verses or so, and then we'll go from there. So let's open it word of prayer. Dear God, we thank you for the opportunity to study. We thank you for your word. Thank you for the uh, truth of it and the fact that we can understand it, Lord. And it's not just a mystical book. It's not a book that, uh, w- that is voodoo or anything like that, Lord, but that it is a, is a book of, of spiritual truth that requires the Holy Spirit to understand to interpret, and then ultimately grow in it. And we thank you for it in your son's name we pray. Acts chapter 9, verse 1. And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what will thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. And Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes were open, he saw no man, but they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight, and neither did eat nor drink. And there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias, and to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Arise, and go into the street, which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas, for one called Saul of Tarsus, for behold, he prayeth, and hath seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hands on him, that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he hath done to thy saints at Jerusalem. And and, and here, he hath authority from the chief priest to bind all that call on thy name. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way. For he is a chosen vessel unto me, to bear my name before the Gentiles, and the kings, and the children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. When Jesus Christ himself came down from the right hand of God, that's where he was seated, and he spoke directly to Saul of Tarsus from that light, I believe it was almost instantaneous that Saul repented. It was like that. He knew exactly what was happening. You can see it in his voice when he trembles there, and he's astonished, and he says, Lord, what will thou have me to do? He recognizes, he says, well, what I was doing, well, that's clearly not what I was supposed to be doing because I was persecuting you. So what should I go do? And you realize that what he does 
is a whole lot. He writes 13 epistles in your Bible. Think about that. Peter, how many did you write? Well, hold on. I thought you were really influential in the starting of the kingdom church. Why do you only have two? The importance of that is great. And you have to ask yourself questions like that. James, how many did you write? John, how many did you get? Four. Four five. Right. Not many. Not 13, right? So you start to go, okay, well, what does that mean? Why do we care about that? Well, does it, does it matter? Well, yes. You should care what God has to say. And the more he says it through one man, the more you should pay attention and say, well, why this guy? Why not Peter? Why not James? Why not John? Why do we need this guy here, Saul of Tarsus? Why didn't God just come down and strike him dead? Like I said, I believe it was almost instantaneous that he repented, for he, he understood what he was doing. But it also shows his devotion to God, his zeal of God, because he had a prompt desire to change what he was, he was doing. He said, oh, oh, I, 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 what am I going to do now? Lord, what will thou have me to do? For his yearning before, while ignorant and wrong, was to follow and obey and please God. But it was done in his flesh, and it was done without knowledge. And now, he was forced with a change. When confronted with the truth of Jesus Christ, being alive and speaking directly to him. See, one of the big issues was that they, they argued that Jesus wasn't alive. That's part of the, one of the big issues here. We killed him. Stop talking about him. It's, it's, he's dead. He's dead. To which Peter says, um, you sure he's dead? Because I'm pretty sure in Acts 2 he says, he has shed forth this which you now see and hear. How are we doing this? How did you guys hear in your native tongue? How am I healing this person? How, how is this taking place if Jesus Christ is dead? Those proofs are evidence of his resurrection, that he was from God and that death could not hold him. The only person who would be able to raise him up would be God the Father. And God the Father did that. Again, this event that takes place here, it's almost an unbelievable event. You read it and you go, man, why? We know what God does to those who don't listen to the mouth of prophets. What happens to them? The end of them is never good. So why would God be so nice? Why would God be so gracious? Why would he demonstrate mercy toward a man so undeserving of his mercy? Well, as Peter says in Acts 3, look at this. We're going to run quite a few verses, so I hope you have your Bible fingers ready. You will feel like you are at... I used to go to Camp Gilead when I was a little kid. You guys know what Camp Gilead is? Maybe some of you guys know. Camp Gilead, nobody knows what that is? It's a little camp in Central Florida. We always have, used to always have sword drills. Those are like my favorites. And then the kids would have tabs, and I'm like, it's okay, I don't even need the tabs. We're good. I'm going to do it without it. <laughs> do it live, yeah, it's cheater tabs. We don't need those cheater tabs. I'm good, I got it down. In Acts chapter number 3, verse number 23, it's pretty clear what happens when you don't listen to the mouth of the prophet. Okay, we know what happens. It states it right here. It shall come to pass that every soul which will not hear the prophet shall be destroyed from among the people. All right. Would it be fair of God to do that? Sure. Is it just of God to do that? Absolutely he is. God's always righteous. He's always just. He's always fair. Now, it might not look fair to you, but your definition of fair is probably not the same as God's. It can be hard to reconcile how God would allow Ananias and Sapphira to be killed just a couple chapters ago. Right there in Acts chapter number 5. Remember? They had that, that plot of land and everybody was selling their land and that's what Jesus Christ had commanded them to do. Peter has no money when that you know, lame man says, hey, do you got anything to give me? He says, hey, silver and gold have I none. I, I don't have anything. I, I gave it all away because I'm looking to go right into this kingdom and we'll close this for right now closing the chart here, showing you, I'm getting ready to go in this kingdom. <laughs> what do I need any of that stuff for? And they, they lie. They don't sell their possession. 
They try to make it appear that they do sell their possessions to Peter. And you ask yourself, why would they do that? Well, there again, we've, we've gone over that message in, at length, but in particular, they did that because it was commanded of them that they should sell their possessions. Jesus Christ makes it clear, sell that you have. He says that the kingdom of heaven is likened unto a field that the treasure is hidden there. And when a man finds it, he goeth and for joy selleth what? He just selleth little pieces? No, he selleth all that he hath. Right? Okay. So let's look around and say, okay, is Christianity following that? Is anybody in the church today homeless? Find me somebody. I mean, really, I truly want to know, does anybody not have a home? Then you go back and you say, all right, well, let's, uh, let's find out, does anybody have a pantry full of food? Anybody have a pantry full of food? I think you all do, right? Everybody's got a pantry full of food. Why do you have a pantry full of food? Why are you storing up and sowing and harvesting? Jesus Christ, quite frankly, tells you not to do that. Or does he? Did he tell you not to do that? See, the problem is, is that most in Christianity want to just fake it. The idea is let's just fake it, let's just make it fake, and, and we'll say we're doing all these things. We'll put a smile on our face and grin and say God's answering our prayers, that miracles are being worked. But then we come down and go, is that really happening? Is that really taking place? And then you don't want to be the guy who's, who's questioning anything because then that just shows you you don't have enough faith. So you sit there in the pew and you just, you just go on. You just nod your head and say, I'm not, God forbid, I question anything. God forbid I do my own research and reading and study the scriptures to see if such things are so. But it is. It's hard to reconcile. If you don't appreciate the dispensational change that occurs in Acts chapter number 9. I know. Everybody gets all up in arms. Uh-oh. You said the word dispensation. We know where this is going to go. Well, I didn't make up the word. The word's in the word of God. So if it's there, I'm going to use the word that's there in the word of God. He says it's the dispensation of the grace of God. So it's not like we're creating some doctrine. People go, oh, you're a dispensationalist. Well, yes, I am. Because Paul was a dispensationalist, and God's a dispensationalist. Don't believe me? Look what happens in Acts chapter 9. There's a dispensation that's introduced. Pretty clear. So, the change that occurs from our study of the book of Acts I think we're pretty aware of, of what the scriptures of the prophets look like. Is anybody kind of confused at what happens with the scriptures of the prophets? What's the next step in the, in, the, in the agenda? I mean, we have what? We have the tribulation, right? Day of the Lord, the days of vengeance. We have the second coming. We have a, a judgment that takes place right here. And then we have the kingdom. Okay? That's all prophesied. All prophesied. Peter will tell you that. We'll look at that. The Lord Jesus Christ will tell you that. Isaiah will tell you that. Zechariah will tell you that. Joel will tell you that. Amos will tell you that. Okay, so what happens right here in Acts chapter number 9? None of that stuff. Because I'm going to show you today that those days of vengeance is a avenging against those who are unbelievers, those who are sinners, and in particular... Paul, Saul of Tarsus, would be a prime candidate for the outpouring of God's wrath. Would he not? Yeah, he would. And that's why you have to sit there and ask yourself the question, okay, why then? Why did this need to take place? What was the issue? Peter explained in Acts chapter number 2, after the issue of the tongues had taken place and individuals had just spoken in a tongue that was native to others, more just other languages, and as they spoke these languages, the question asked, hey, what's going on? What's the deal? What's happening here? Very easy. Peter explains to you what's happening here. And he says, look, hey, these guys aren't drunk. He says that in verse 15. He says in verse 16, he says this, is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. Everybody understands what prophecy is, right? Prophets talked. They spoke. They were God's messengers. And they wrote down what was to occur, and they looked forward to the future of that actually occurring. And here, Peter, by the Holy Spirit, is speaking and says, hey, what's happening right here, right now? 
This is what happens, what Joel was talking about. He says, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And he goes on to tell you there a little bit about what that is. I want to show you how this appearance of Jesus Christ so radically varies with how God's prophetic program is laid out. And that it is not possible that you reconcile the two together unless you see the need for the dispensation of the grace of God. You'll never reconcile it. You will, you will sit there in a circle. I saw the, sat there the other day and I saw the little, um, what's the little sit and spins? Do you remember those things? Little kid, you sit and spin? And I just saw it and I was like, we're totally getting Noah one of those. <laughs> My, that's my son, Noah. It's the best thing ever. You sit and spin on it. But that's what you'll do if you don't reconcile the two differences. You'll sit on a sit and spin, and you'll just spin. And you'll get yourself sick, and you'll think you know what's going on. You need to get off of it, take a look, and go, okay, I see the programs here. I see what God's, what God's doing here. So Peter, explaining this in Acts chapter number 2, he tells you what, that, what the prophet Joel talked about. He goes back and he quotes the prophet Joel. All right, that'd be fitting to do. Go ahead, and he quotes it here. Acts 2, verse 17, it shall come to pass in the, what? In the last days. Last days. Last days. Okay? Saith God. Note that it's God that speaks through the prophets. It's not really the prophet's issue. It's not like, oh, Jeremiah, he's real great. Well, that's still the word of God. You reverence the prophet Jeremiah like you reverence God. Because God's word is manifest through prophets. He says, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens, I will pour out in, again, he's making a specific reference to these, these days, because that's how prophecy works. It works in days, it works in years, it works in months. He says, in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. What else is going to happen? He says, I will show wonders in heaven above and signs of the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. Now look at verse number 20. This is really important because we're going to see this pop up a lot. He says, the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before that great and notable day of the Lord come. Verse 21, and it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So we understand what's taking place here is God the Father working through Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit through the Apostle Peter to discuss and tell the nation of Israel the prophetic program. He's saying, I want to remind you. <laughs> the reason why he's reminding him is because they don't read their scriptures. They're not familiar with their scriptures. We understand that from the Ethiopian eunuch. He didn't know what he was reading. He sat there and he's like, I got no idea. How can I except some man should guide me? No different. They get it. They needed understanding. They needed teaching. They didn't have the pastors. They didn't have the shepherds. They didn't have the leaders. So, I think this is clear that God's clearly continuing on his prophetic program. Is he not? Yeah. Acts 2, continuing on the prophetic program, no doubt in my mind. This tribulation is, is, is what is, is, being, is really being discussed, discussed. It's called the tribulation. The, the tribulation, what is it? It's really just the judgment of God, again, like I've said, not only upon Israel, but it's also upon the world for their sin and their unbelief. Now, I want to explain to you the truth about the tribulation. The truth about the tribulation is that those who were saved, and that, you know, there's, there's many saved, the justified saints during the tribulation, many would die during the tribulation. And they would die as kind of collateral consequences to the outpouring of God's wrath. Really? Yes. It happens. And they're also killed by those who are, again, revolting against God. Now, is any of that really taking place today? Would you say in America that, you know, we'll get killed? Can I go out on a street corner? I mean, this guy does. You see him all the time with that cross. He walks around. Have you seen him? Walks around all the time. Anybody killing him? Not yet. Not yet. Anybody shooting him? No, nothing like that. He walks around. He's got the little cross. He's got the little Star of David and all that fun stuff. So this tribulation is very severe. I want you to make sure it's really clear in your head that this isn't something that should be taken lightly. This is something that is very serious. This is God recompensing back to the world what it is due. He's saying it's time. And now's the time. In Matthew chapter 24, Jesus Christ discusses a little bit more in detail in verse number 32 he says this 24 verse 32 or 22 I'm sorry Matthew 24 verse 22 he talks about 
the tribulation in verse 21. And then he says, and except those days should be shortened, talking about, again, days. Remember? It's really important we notice that. He isn't just talking about at one period of time. I have a, I have a friend that we, we go back and forth on YouTube. He's, he's always telling me that the tribulation is just one day. I'm like, no, how, how do we reconcile these verses except, except those days be shortened? So I'll, obviously it's a multitude of days. It takes place over a period of time. He says, should be shortened. There should no flesh be saved. So clearly, this is a really bad time, and it is shortened down to seven years as we know. And if he didn't shorten it down, no flesh would be saved, and God does it for the sheer purpose of those who are saved, the elect, as he says there. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be saved. I'll, I will discuss that elect at, probably in the next sermon, or the sermon after next, when we discuss the Apostle Paul's election, and we'll, we'll discuss how people really love Calvinism nowadays. It's like the new, the new craze. I mean, pretty much every major guy that's out there, I listed the other day to, for a friend of mine, he, he didn't really believe me. I, apparently, Bob Jones now is a, is a Calvinist school. I didn't, I didn't really understand that. My dad says, yeah, they're getting really bad. I said, wow, I was kind of surprised. But then I talked to two or three friends of mine who just went to Bob Jones, and our spiritual discussions turned immediately to Calvinism. And I'm like, oh, my goodness. All right, what, what are we doing here? We're just waxing philosophical. We don't need to do this. We need to get back to the Word of God. But you can list them out. I mean, I can just, I'll give you a couple just in case you don't know any of them. Francis Chan, John MacArthur, John Piper. Mark Driscoll, Matt Chandler, David Platt. I mean, just go all those. There's, there's more and there's more and there's more. We could keep going. Uh, and, and those guys are who mainstream Christianity follows today. I mean, I can't tell you the amount of time I see a cool Instagram picture that's got a cool filter on it and some guy's reading Radical by David Platt. And then I'm saying to myself, well, stop being such a hypocrite. Go ahead and sell your stuff now. But they don't do that. Well, that's a cool iPhone. You got to take that picture of that really expensive book you bought, too. You pay 99 cents for that Instagram app, too? It's just hypocrisy. That's what it really is. And, and so you call it out, and what do they say now? The only heresy is calling heresy heresy. I'm like, what? What does that mean? So now we can't even call heresy heresy because that's, call, that's heresy? I'm like, you guys are just ridiculous. I said, no. Paul says it was necessary that there, there be heresies among you, that those that are approved may be made manifest. Okay. So we are made manifest when we're approved. Now, how do you get approved? Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Okay, well, how do you do that? Well, this is what we're doing right now. We're opening up the word of God and saying, some of these things don't really fit. And instead of going, you know, round hole, square peg, and then saying, oh, yeah, it fit, and you just throw the peg around the corner, we say, okay, well, how do we reconcile this? How do we deal with this? This is a very intense time of God's wrath being poured out upon the world. How do we know that these events are talking about the tribulation? Well, if you go back up just one verse, he says there in verse 21, he says, For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor shall ever be. So, you think the Holocaust was bad? It will pale in comparison to the tribulation of those days. In Zechariah chapter number 13, and I know I mention this a lot, but people always ask me, how do you, how can, Jason, how can you, how can you go back to Zechariah and tell me that this is what's being discussed here, the tribulation? How can you tell me that this is about the second coming? How can you tell me it's about these things? Well, again, if Peter tells you that these are the last days, and he tells you there in Acts chapter number 3, you know, that as many of the prophets from Samuel, those that follow after, as many as have spoken, have likewise foretold of these days, again, that's how we're coming to this understanding. I want you to be able to say that to somebody if they ask you, well, how do you know how to use Zechariah that way? Well, that's how we use it because Peter tells you about it during the prophetic program back in Acts chapter number 3. So in Zechariah chapter number 13, he talks about this issue of, of the tribulation. He discusses how, how bad it really will be and how many will die. And I wish I had time to talk about some of the election issues and that stuff, but let's just keep going. He says in verse 8, he says, And it shall come to pass that in all the land, saith the Lord, two parts therein shall be cut off and die, but the third shall be left therein. And I will bring the third part through the fire. Again, fire is discussing what? Well, it's kind of like when Jesus Christ says there's going to be a baptism with fire. Okay. So what is that baptism with fire? Baptism with fire would be that tribulation period of time. It's not a water baptism, because unless you're going to take the baptismal and pour a little gasoline and light it on fire, I don't think you're going to have a very good time getting baptized with fire that way, right? 
All right, so he goes on to say, and I will refine them as silver is refined, and I will try them as gold is tried. They shall call on my name, and I will hear them. I will say, it is my people, and they shall say, the Lord is my God. Okay, so now people will say, well, how do we know that's the tribulation? Well, look what he's getting ready to discuss there in verse 14. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh. There you go. There you go. There's the day of the Lord. It's coming. And what's going to take place at this day of the Lord? He says, And thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee. So what happens? For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken, and the house rifled, and women ravished, and half of the city shall go forth into captivity, and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. Now let me ask you a question. Is that what took place at the fall of Jerusalem in AD 70? Can't be. Why? Because the Lord didn't go forth and fight against those nations. Why didn't he do that? Is God a liar? No. So what's the issue? A dispensational change occurred. And what does that mean? God put his prophetic program on hold. How do we know that? Read Acts chapter number 9 and ask me what's going on. See, nobody can really come to grips with Acts chapter number 9. They love the passage. It's great, but ultimately what it does for me, you know what Acts chapter 9 does for me? It's a demonstration of God to the entire world of just how powerful the death of Christ was. He says, you want to see how powerful it is? You want to see how crazy and absolutely unbelievable it is against every sin you've ever committed? Oh, oh, who's the worst guy out there, guys? Oh, Saul of Tarsus. Saul of Tarsus. Everybody knows it's Saul of Tarsus. All right, he's forgiven. God, that's not fair. Yes, it is. How is it fair? See my son over there? What, are you saying he's not sufficient? Oh. Take a step back. Take that back, God. Yep, he's definitely sufficient, definitely fair, definitely just. See, what you start to do is there's this, there's this craze lately, and it just drives me up the wall that people will put conditions precedent and conditions subsequent on your eternal life. I'm against all those people. And all those people, they're accursed. Because they're preaching another gospel. The gospel of the grace of God saves you apart from anything that you're able to do. God says, look, what I want from you is faith. I want you to believe. I'm showing you the light. Will you believe? I saw the light. Somebody brought it to me and said, hey, May 9th, 1989, I'm 40 years old. Now, I understood right and wrong. I understood good and evil. And I said, I need my sins taken care of. Now, I'm not saying every four-year-old's like me, but at four, I was able to understand. And ever since that day, I, don't, I really don't doubt my salvation. I think the reason is my parents instilled to me the efficacy of this cross. They told me how important that was. They said, look, you just always go back there. If God loved you so much, you know, that's, that's the demonstration of it. And he did that to you when? When you reformed up your life and turned from your sin and when you repented. And you truly repented, and then you had saving faith. Oh, my goodness, what does that even mean? I encourage you to go on John MacArthur's website and read his thing entitled Lordship Salvation and, and then go in the, in, the, in, the, in the bathroom and throw up because it's probably the grossest thing you'll ever read. I mean, it really is. It's disgusting. I get a, I get a sickness in my stomach when I go, they zealously affect you but not to good what it is. They make you all like, okay, well, that sounds really good. All right. All right. Okay. I, I got to get the list now. I know what I need to do now. I was really living my life of just sin. I can give you a prime example of it. People don't believe me that this happens in the real world. They just think, you guys just make up these people that you talk to. No, 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 no. This just happened. My wife is at work. All right. New girl starts. New girl starts at work. All right. Jamie gets in her car. They're going to go to lunch. While they're in lunch, got a Bible in the back seat. And they got a Francis Chan book back there, too. Figures, figures. Go down to the modern-day Christian bookstore. What are you going to pick up? You're going to pick up one of these garbage books, and you're going to read it, and then you're going to go work for your salvation the rest of your life. So I, I can already tell you where this is going. I could have told my wife when she was telling me this. I said, uh-huh, go on. I know where this is going. And she goes, and so the girl said to me, she goes, uh, she's like, oh, yeah, Jamie asked about the Bible. She says, oh, yeah, I go to this church. And I go, oh, that's weird. I know that church. And actually, one of the guys that works for me goes to that church. I'm like, and we've been having this discussion lately that he says, my church is not very Calvinistic. I said, no, no, your church is, yeah, it's not just not little Calvinistic. It's fully, deeply involved in it. And they just lie to you and tell you it's not. No, no, it's really not. I'm like, buddy, I've, I've read the doctrinal statement. I've listened to the sermons. I know what it is. No, it's, it's not, man. It's not. You just don't understand. I said, okay, okay. Well, here's, here's somebody. Here's the fruit of that ministry. You want to see the fruit of that ministry? girl says, that she's the chosen of God. And then she goes on to say, not only that, but 
I really determined for, I, I, was, I grew up in church, and I was always thought I was saved. And I, as soon as you hear that word, I know what's coming next. You thought you were saved, and then some guy told you to keep the law. You saw your sin again, and then you condemned yourself. And then you said, okay, let me dig myself out of the hole. That's what you started doing. And you're going to do that till the day you die. And hopefully you really did get saved the first time. You really did place your faith and trust in the blood of Christ. But usually I say it's, it's, it's not likely. It's sad, but very true. So this girl tells Jamie, she says, yeah, and then I was talking to my friend, and I said, I said, do you think that God's going to let you into heaven the way you're living, blah, 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 and telling her all this stuff? And she goes, I cleaned up my act, and I cleaned up my life, and all these things. And I'm like, you really going to look at God and say, man, I really cleaned up myself? No, you're not. You know why? Because the Apostle Paul, even after all of his forgiveness and everything he had, he still calls himself the least of all the saints. He's like, man, I'm no better. I'm really not. I don't deserve this in any way, shape, or form. And so what that does is it breeds about some form of merit, and that's what's instilled in you from a child to be good, work hard, get, you know, follow the golden rule, get the little red sticker, whatever it is, all those little things. But that's, that's man's knowledge. That's man's wisdom. And God says, no, I'm simply looking for you to believe that my son died on the cross for your sins. That's, that's stupid, Jason. That's the most ridiculous thing ever. No conditions precedent, no conditions subsequent. You want to live your life in sin? You're going to anyways. Let's just put it that way. They'll just say, well, I don't live as much in sin. Oh, it's like this. It's like that. It's just like that's not how you gauge your salvation. Your salvation is based upon the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ being sufficient to cover every sin, past, present, and future. How hard is that to get? Why did it happen? Why did he have to do this? And the, the proof is in the Apostle Paul. It's in Saul of Tarsus. That's the guy. Because God's like, well, really, the best way to demonstrate this is to get the worst guy ever and save him. And I don't think anybody would say there's anybody worse than Saul. You follow me? Especially in God's eyes. I mean, the blasphemer, go down. Please, just go down the Ten Commandments. and to, Okay, Saul, it's hard to think you're guilty. You know, I mean, you offended at one point, you're guilty of all. We understand that as well. But, I mean, he's treasured up wrath against himself horribly. And what does God do? Does God come down from heaven and say, Oh, Paul, Saul, it's, it's payday. It's vengeance now. I'm recompensing to you. And here it goes. Wait, that's a bunch of grace. That's a bunch of mercy. It is. But I don't deserve that. Good. I'm glad you see that too. Now what do I do? What do you think you should do? What does the grace of God do to you? Well, what does Paul say? The grace of God that brings salvation hath appeared to the elect. Nope. Again, I could go all day. The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. Why did it appear to all of them? Is that just something God's teasing you with, a carrot out in front? <laughs> you can't even get it, though, because you're not part of the elect. No. no. All right? I, I, if you want to listen more on this, we're going through Romans 9 right now, 9, 10, and 11. We have, a, we have got three or four weeks already over it. You can listen to it. And uh, people, people just really have Calvinism built into them. And they have Charles Spurgeon just into them. And it's like, guys, these are just men. Please. You're worshiping these guys. And it frustrates me to no end. So we don't worship the Apostle Paul, but we do look at him and say, oh, okay, that's a great pattern. It's a great pattern to see the transformation of the gospel. So as you go back through here, you see in verse number 4, what what happens? His feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives. There you go. He's, he's back. Comes back. Look at Matthew 24. That's right where it takes place. You can see how it works. You can read through some more of this here and, and get through Zechariah 14 later. And we saw just how bad the tribulation is in Matthew 24, 21, that no war, famine, or trouble can even be compared to the desolation of this tribulation. Remember, Jesus Christ, he spoke heavily. He spoke heavily of wrath. People think that Jesus Christ just spoke about peace and love and joy and all those things. No, really. I mean, they, have, they forget who Jesus Christ is. You know, a lot of people like Jesus Christ. You know, Gandhi likes Jesus Christ. Uh, a lot of people like him, but they don't like him for the right reasons, and they don't see him as the judge of the world. In Luke chapter number 21, this is a passage I often go to, because Jesus Christ, right before his death, makes a statement. Luke 21, verse number 21, 
He says, then let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains, and let them which are in the midst of it depart out, and let not them that are in the countries enter therein too. What happens? For these be the days of vengeance. Who is the only one that rightfully can do vengeance? That would be God. Because he does it justly. He says that all things which are written may be fulfilled. Oh, okay. What are those all things that are written? Go back to those prophets that we just started reading. Okay? That's what Peter was telling you that has to take place. That the mouth of all the holy prophets have spoken since the world began. Right? There they are. Right there. He says, well, what happens? But woe unto them that are with children. Why woe? Because it's not going to be a pleasant experience here on earth. It's going to be a really bad experience. And he says, and to them that give suck. In those days, again, a plural of days. If I could just show people that, it helps them so much see that this is not just a one-day event. He says, for there shall be great distress in the land. And what happens? And wrath upon the people. You can go through and read all the vials and, and all, the, all the judgments that are poured out in the book of Revelation. Very interesting. Don't have time to go through it. But I want to look and show you with the next verse. He says in verse 24, And they shall fall by the edge of the sword, and shall be led away captive into all nations, and Jerusalem shall be trodden down, what? Of the Gentiles, until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Now, I've been studying this pretty intently, and I've pretty much come to the conclusion now that what is taking place here when he's saying trodden down the Gentiles and the times of the Gentiles will be fulfilled, I do not believe the times of the Gentiles would be the fullness of the Gentiles. And here's why I say that. Because in Romans chapter number 11, the Apostle Paul discusses the mystery in relation to the fullness of the Gentiles. And the end of that versus the end of this are two different things. So we realize, okay, one's according to prophecy and one's according to mystery. These times the Gentiles is about the nation of Israel, again, I believe, being saved from the hand of them that hate them and delivered from the Gentile world power. You may say again, well, how does this really relate to Saul's conversion? Well, how does this go back to, to, to Acts chapter number 9? Again, because the conversion of Saul is not found in prophecy. Find him for me. Find him there. Oh, no, I know exactly what happens to those that hate God. What happens to them? Utter destruction. They're destroyed. God's wrath is poured out upon them. Okay? So that didn't happen to Saul of Tarsus. This helps us further grasp the uniqueness of the revelation of the mystery. Run a few verses. Go to Luke chapter 2, verse 38. Schofield says it in his notes. He says, Schofield states that the times of the Gentiles began with the captivity of Judah under Nebuchadnezzar, and ever since then, Jerusalem has not really been what? They've never been fully autonomous. They're still underneath Roman rulership. They're still underneath Roman what? And that's pretty much a curse against them because of that. In Luke chapter number 2, verse 38, you, you see Simeon here discussing the prophecy of looking for the Lord's Christ. And then he says that he sees the, the, the Savior. And if you notice what he says there in, in verse 25, that he was waiting for the consolation of Israel. And I'm going to show you how that relates in a second. The consolation of Israel. And not only that, if you read down in verse number 38, he says they, they looked for the redemption of Israel. So Anna, Simeon, the redemption, the consolation of Israel. Okay, the redemption in Jerusalem. Well, what is that going to take place? How does that happen? You go back just at one page over to Luke chapter number 1, and you start reading. And you see the prophet Zacharias speaking. And he says in verse number 70, as he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been since the world began. Again, nothing mystery about this, nothing mysterious about this. Just straightforward prophecy program. We're just continuing through it, working our way through. Shouldn't be any big deal. And he says that what's going to happen? Well, of course, the nation of Israel gets what? That we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all them that hate us. To do what? To perform the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant. Great. Okay, we understand that. Saved from the hand of the enemies. I think there's some correlation between uh, verses like Zechariah 13 and verse 9. And then you can just mark in your Bible later for Romans, uh, or Revelation, I'm sorry, 11, 15. So just mark those later since time is running out. But read that, Revelation 13, 9 and 14, 9. And Revelation, I'm sorry, Zechariah 14.9, Revelation 11.15, uh, which basically discusses the kingdoms becoming the kingdoms of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. 
And the, this Gentile dominion is seen in really familiar passages. I remember when I was a little kid, I used to quote Luke 2 at the uh, Sparks carol Aramas. We'd go to the mall and we'd sing, you know, Christmas carols. And I used to go, It went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And I was like, I didn't know what that meant. Who's Caesar Augustus and why should I care? And now I go, well, I do care about Caesar Augustus, and I think he's kind of important, and especially how I see this deliverance from the hand of them that hate him. They do hate him. So if you keep going through here, and, and we'll, we'll kind of figure this out, again, this times the Gentiles, they, they just look at Romans 11, uh, compare that to Luke chapter 21, in particular Romans 11, 25 to 36. So what I want to make is very clear is that God is against those who are against him and against his people. He will repay, he will re revenge, he has promised to do so, and he must. Very quickly, in Luke chapter 4, don't have to turn there, but Jesus Christ goes into a synagogue, picks up the copy of the, of the prophet Isaiah, starts discussing the first half of it, and then he leaves out the second half because it wasn't time for the acceptable year of the Lord to be preached, right? Meaning, I'm sorry, he wasn't prepared. He, the acceptable year of the Lord was ready to be preached, but the day of vengeance was not. He quotes you back to uh, Isaiah chapter 60, verse 2, and that's where I want to spend just a second. If you look at Isaiah 60, verse 2, Sixty one verse two. He says, To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God. And look what he says there, to comfort all that mourn. I really think you could go back and look at uh, Revelation chapter number six, verse ten, and that's that's really similar to what ends up happening there, because in the book of Revelation, many have died, many have been killed for the name of Jesus Christ. And what he says is he those people say to, to, to God the Father and to Jesus say, Hey, Revelation 6, verse 10, and they cry with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? Now it's clear that the horrendous you know, works of Saul of Tarsus were evident, that, that, and he would be a prime candidate, as I said, of pouring out uh, of God's wrath upon him. Did he listen to Peter? No. Did Saul of Tarsus listen to the mouth of Stephen when he was standing by consenting unto his death? No. So, what should happen to him? He should be destroyed. He should be killed. His damnation is just. I believe God could have avenged the saints who had died at the hand of Saul, but it will make it clear that God's plan was Saul's conversion. God's plan wasn't like, oh, man, I finally need to do something about this. Don't let anybody ever tell you that. He had this planned. He knew what he was doing. He had planned this before the world began. I believe that God's plan was to make Saul a convert, and that God by foreknowledge knew that Saul of Tarsus would choose him when brought to the light of Jesus Christ. As I said, I've been going through that issue of Calvinism quite heavily. There's plenty of verses on it, and we're going to pick up with that probably in a week or two. But this issue of vengeance, this issue of wrath, please just give me two more verses and we'll close. Isaiah 13, please. In Isaiah chapter number 13, read in verse number 6. It says, Howl ye, for the day of the Lord is at hand. It shall come as a destruction from the Almighty. Therefore shall all hands be faint, every man's heart shall melt, and they shall be afraid. Pangs and sorrows shall take hold of them. They shall be in pain as a woman that travaileth. They shall be amazed one another. Their faces shall be as flames. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, cruel both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the hand desolate, lay on desolate, and he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. For the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light. Ooh, interesting. The sun shall be darkened in his going forth, and the moon shall not cause her light to shine. What's happening there? Hey, isn't that what Peter was just talking about? Isn't that what Jesus Christ was talking about in Matthew 24? Hey, hey, this, this light that took place when Saul of Tarsus, his appearance, was that this light? No. We read in Amos that the day of the Lord is not light. It's darkness. So why is he coming back? Well, note that he doesn't come back. He gets sent back. And I believe that God the Father told Jesus Christ, go down and talk to Saul of Tarsus. And very similar to how he did with John, the writer of the book of Revelation, and giving him that vision, he went and said, here, here's the revelation of Jesus Christ to John. Here's the beginning of the revelation of Jesus Christ to Saul of Tarsus. And I want to make it very clear. People will get so confused about the revelation of the mystery. They think that it happened, you know, okay, one-time event, you know, Jesus and Saul sat down and they discussed everything. Okay, we're done. 
No, you saw from the text that didn't take place. It was very quick. He didn't, send, he didn't tell him a whole lot of stuff. He just said, here's what's going to happen. I'm going to show you what, what things you're going to have to suffer for my name's sake, and you're a chosen vessel unto me to go to the Gentiles and to the kings and to the children of Israel. He didn't sit there and explain to him the nuances and details of the body of Christ. He didn't sit there and explain to him the rapture. He didn't. He did eventually, and that's because he had the abundance of revelations. So this issue here, in verse number 11, you read, And I will punish the world for their evil, and the wicked for their iniquity, and I will cause the arrogancy of the proud to cease, and I will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. That would be something great for Saul of Tarsus. But what God decides to do is he says, you know what? I already had this planned. And now I'm going to reveal this over just to show you, like in 1 Corinthians 2, just how great this is, just how, just how this mystery is going to blow all of your minds. And it's been blowing everybody's mind ever since, and it's going, whoosh, right over most people's heads. And you see what? A dispensation of grace. What is grace? It's an abatement of God's what? Wrath. He's saying, I'm holding it back. 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 Going to keep holding it back until when? Until the fullness of the Gentiles be brought in. And what ends up happening then? God says, okay. They have wrath going to come. That's why Paul says in the beginning of Romans, he says, you treasure up, you treasure up wrath. You treasure up wrath unto the day of wrath. You follow me how you can keep treasuring it up, meaning that God's not pouring it out upon you right now? He says, nope. Look how many horrible nations are in leadership. Next week, we're going to pick up and, and see just how the Apostle Paul was chosen. I want to show you how that works. I want you to go home tonight and go read the book of Joel and tell me if you find Saul of Tarsus in there. It's only a couple chapters. It won't take you very long. You won't find him in there. But what you will find is evidence of the prophetic program in full swing. Everything that Peter talked about, everything that the Lord Jesus Christ talked about, it was all plain as day. So does that mean that Jesus Christ's words are of none effect and that Peter's words are of none effect? No. Because God had a plan, and this wasn't plan B, this was plan A all along. He had a plan, he kept it secret. It was the dispensation of the grace of God, and what better way to introduce it to demonstrate the power, the efficacy, and the grace of the cross of Christ on a man who deserved it least. And I think Paul, I think he struggled with that. I think he struggled with it almost his whole life. I think he just, he just, sometimes he's like, there's no way. Is this, this is really, I'm, I'm completely forgiven? Mm -hmm. That's why he says, back there in Ephesians, he says, unto me, who am less than the least of all saints. I think he's kind of beating himself up sometimes. He's like, man, read Romans 7. You don't think he's beating himself up? He's beating himself up. He knows what he's going through. He knows the same things. He's got the same problems you and I have. He ain't some magical man that's just like, ooh, Paul, you're so great. We can see him being disobedient to the Lord Jesus Christ. He is. He does that in, later on in the book of Acts. Don't go to Jerusalem. I'm going to go anyways. Don't go to Jerusalem. How many times have we got to tell you, don't go to Jerusalem? Let me, th let me ask you this question. Did he get that sin taken care of? He did. All of them. Every single one. The disappearance of Jesus Christ was outside of prophecy. And we're going to pick that up next week. Let's close in prayer.